everyone. Welcome back to She Bears Podcast. Today's guest is Gary. Hi, Gary. Hey, how you doing today? Thank you so much for being a guest today. Yeah, but of course. I'm excited to be here and speak with you for a bit. Yeah, me too. So can you tell my listeners what inspired you to write Unjustified, Where Have Our Black Leaders Gone? Uh, thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, so that book was really inspired so long ago, you know, in my youth, uh, going through high school, I've been thinking about these things forever, right? Um, and then ultimately, like we all do, we graduate and then we get into life. You know, you go to some people go to college, some people right into the workforce. Uh, myself, I went to school, met my my wife. You know, we were kind of high school sweethearts. We married early, and I jumped right into all of that. And I left this topic alone, but it always stayed with me, and I was always thinking about it and watching how our communities right, get affected and are, are, and, are, and are kind of handled and dealt with and abused and misused uh, in the history of this country. I've always thought about these things for so long. The last couple of years, I've really had a chance to see it uh, explode in a, just an unbelievable fashion as we've been watching the last couple of years, you know? Um, and just the, the uprest and the, the, the unrest and the unruliness of what's been going on really drove me to say, hey, now is the time. Let's get this thing out. And it also coincides with the fact that, I've you know, these last few years, I've just been raising my family and building businesses. And as some of that comes to an end, you know, my children are in college, graduating school. I now have time and energy in a different way than I used to. So I now have the ability to just dive in and write about these things, talk about these things, and share this uh, with the larger community. Yeah. So before we went live on here, we were speaking about about Black issues in the Black community. And I had mentioned um, a lot of my generation, they mentioned what, why can't we do the same thing that white people do? White people do this, so why can't we do it? And yeah. we <laughs> we mentioned, why do we have to do the same things white people do. Like, why can't we build up our own community, love each other, help each other? It seems yeah. like within the black community, we are competing against each other. We're fighting each other. We're killing each other. And yeah, this this thing this thing is a problem for us. Um, and oftentimes, we're defining ourselves by the definition of others, and that's where it's rooted from, right? You know, we've we've been defined, and our success has been defined, and areas in which we're able to operate has been defined. And therefore, we start to look at those things and say, all right, that's about my limit. And when we start to dream about things we want, we oftentimes look at the same white examples that have been before us and say, hey, I want that too. And the problem there is that those things don't necessarily serve us, right? Exactly. The things that white people do in their community and wish for themselves and, and how they aspire and grow, that those things aren't necessarily in line with us building our communities and growing our communities. Oftentimes they're in direct opposition. And in my book, I write about that. Uh, I call it dream a dream of white, where we aspire to be and have and do exactly what wealthy and affluent white people be and have and do. And that's not necessarily in our best interest. And we have to really start to redefine those things so we can redefine the narratives, the experience, and more important, the outcomes that we're getting out of our lives and communities as we move forward. Yeah, I agree. It seems like my generation is, I'm not saying they wasn't raised <laughs> great by my mom's generation. It's just that they... <laughs> I'm trying to say it in a nice way. We were, we really weren't weren't taught yeah. about our culture for real. Okay. Like my mom's generation. I mean, I'm not saying they did a bad job, but they just didn't do a good job. <laughs> like, well, they didn't drive. They didn't drive home certain lessons and certain conversations, <laughs> right? Just matters of awareness, and that's <laughs> that's oftentimes what this book is about, right? There, there are topics and conversations that are timely for our children, especially our young people, right? So this way they understand how to engage the world that they're about to meet and how to be successful in navigating that world. And just to be aware, because you know we talk about the conversation that we have in our, in our households. And oftentimes it's revolved around um, issues of police brutality or something like, but our conversation doesn't stop there. It extends to so many other issues and topics. And the more we have those conversations and the earlier we have those conversations, the more likely our children are to be very successful on their journey when it's their turn. 
And I, what I've done was put that into practice with my own children. As I've grown and raised them, I said, you know, I'm going to have these conversations early. I'm going to make them aware and make them responsible early. I'm going to hold a high bar and demand that they grow to it. And the craziest thing happened. They did. <laughs> they grew to that bar. They accepted the responsibility. They didn't shy away from the difficult matters or the difficult conversations. And they're growing up to be excellent human beings. And that's what we need to do in our communities for ourselves, because no one else is going to do that. Exactly, exactly. And a lot of people, when you discuss these type of topics with other races, they're like, oh, well, you're trying to separate us. You're trying to yeah. um, think you're better than us. And you only think that your lives matter. And I'm like, no, we're trying to make our lives better. We're trying to improve our lives. And yeah. like with mental illness, it's not discussed in the black community. Mental illness. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, <laughs> let's see. Within mental illness, like um, <laughs> depression, anxiety, yeah, things like sure. that. And it's not widely discussed in our community. And that's another issue as well. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, we don't nearly have enough of those conversations. But when we're having them with other people, this is where, listen, uh, this is not easy space. It's not easy ground to cover. You know, um, we have to do it thoughtfully and carefully and considerately, you know, Oftentimes we're going to make mistakes in the language we use and sometimes we're going to get overly emotional and it's going to feel like, hey, we're not talking. It feels like you're attacking me. Yeah. And the reality is, look, sometimes that's going to happen and that doesn't have to stop the conversation. You know, sometimes someone um, of the white persuasion is going to stand <laughs> up and, and put their foot right in their mouth. Right. Yeah. And it's not because they have bad intention. It's because they don't know how to have these conversations. Yeah. So oftentimes, and this is where I say be considerate, mm -hmm. allow people to make mistakes, mm -hmm. allow yourself to correct them, allow them to learn so they could grow and do better and share and make change in their lives and their communities. We have to be thoughtful when we come to this table and not just of ourselves, but the people across the table from us. And when we do that, oftentimes, Again, the crazy thing that happens is you start to find common ground and work towards and closer to each other by the end of the conversation. So, you know, we just have to be thoughtful of it. But at the same time, we have to have these conversations and we can't not have them because of your delicate constitution. Right? Like these yeah. conversations need to be had. We need to share them. We need to have them and we need to be honest about them. And ultimately, what we're starting to see is there's this larger conversation trying to minimize conversations and reduce. And, uh, you know, it feels like they're trying to outlaw it. But, you know, we'll, we'll see if they get to that step. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I feel like with um, our community, we get um, what do you call it? Stereotype. Um, I've, I've had a lot of I've come across a lot of other races that said that they are afraid of me specifically because they said that black women have that aggressive type attitude, mm -hmm. aggressive, meaning um, rude, disrespectful, ghetto attitude. And I'm like, uh, but they said, you don't do that because you act white. And I'm like, so what is acting white? How am I acting white? Like, I just don't understand that term. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, listen, there, the stereotypes exist because we live in a society and we're totally influenced by what we watch and what we consume. And, you know, that's that's around us and that's a big business. Right. So it's, it doesn't happen accidentally. And it's not something that can just be dismissed, you know, with a wave of a hand because it's intentional and it's in front of us and around us and we're surrounded by it. And it affects us whether we like it or not. So, you know, the stereotypes exist because others have laid that on us. And then the other half of the conversation, and this is where I like to dive deep into these conversations, right? Mm -hmm. There is obviously a systematically imposed limitation that's imposed on us in our communities. And that for sure exists in a lot of spaces. And then there are the self-inflicted wounds that we create ourselves in our communities. And when we talk about stereotypes, both of those things play out as well. What others think of us unjust, you know, unjustly or not, what they think about us and how they, you know, fear us and, and, and are concerned and scared. And then the things that we do to uphold that same criticism, oftentimes, we have to be careful and mindful of that. It's still no reason to be racist and 
uh, discriminatory and all of the other things that are, you know, create the disparity and equity differences in our, in our communities. But we are also responsible for some of our pain. And when we begin to recognize that, we will start to minimize some of that because we no longer need to play into those things, right? We, don't need to, we no longer need to play into a stereotype. We no longer need to uphold it. It's like the use of the word nigger, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes that's used in our communities as a term of endearment. Now we're going to take hold of it. We're going to empower ourselves with it. But at the end of the day, that thing just needs to be abandoned and abolished. That doesn't serve us in any fashion. So this is where the stereotype lay, laid on us and lay, laid at our feet. But then sometimes we'll hold on to it and keep it alive in some of our actions and behaviors. And this is where we find ourselves drowning in a problem and it's not until we look at the anchor that we are holding in our hands, recognizing, my goodness, it doesn't even belong to me. I am sinking and drowning, holding on to this thing. All I need to let it go and I will float to the top and that will no longer hold or harm or push me back or reduce me in some manner. And these are the things that we have to do. The stereotypes exist because they have been created. This is the system we were born into. We have to do better about really just conscious and aware of how we're uh, holding those things in place and then continuing to chip away at the narrative to rewrite it or dismantle it, right? And those are the, that's how we handle the stereotype conversation. But, you know, some people are, are stuck. And yeah. for those individuals, there's nothing to be said to them, right? You have to let them go. Uh, what do you tell someone who doesn't want to hear it? Nothing. Nothing at all, because they don't want to hear it. Don't waste your breath. Don't waste the opportunity. When I think of planting seeds, um, I can throw them on concrete and they might find a crack or two and grow up in a sliver somewhere. Or I can wait and go find fertile ground and plant my seed there and let's see what happens. So this is where we just have to be careful of how we engage those who want to hold stereotypes, because for some, there's just nothing to be said. That's true. That's true. So as an activist, what, how have you helped our community? Like as an activist, have you gone and spoken to the black community or anything like that? Like, what do you do as an activist? Yeah. So in the activism space, that's something in my family that's legacy work. So we've been doing, we've been serving the New York and Long Island areas um, for just about 60 years, you know, uh, from my, from my mother and, and the legacy of her community activism and what you know my brothers and I have picked up and what we continue to do. Um, we've been doing this for quite some time. And it started, you know, it, it takes on a bunch of different shapes and faces. Sometimes it's gonna look like, uh, you know, just community organization. Let's get ourselves together. Let's clean and beautify our own community. Let's strengthen ourselves. Um, Sometimes it's legislative advocacies where we're writing bills and changing laws and, uh, you know, kind of uh, going up to the to the legislative building in Albany here in New York. Right. Uh, we go up to see the elected officials there and we demand and we hold rallies and press conferences and we storm their offices and we have conversations. Sometimes uh, it'll look like a a local rally supporting a local person with an issue or a problem or something that they're going through, some traumatic event. Um, sometimes it's just us in the community showing up for our local youth sports and supporting them in some way, shape or form. So it looks like any and all of that throughout my lifetime. And I continue to do those things. And I really like to do it in the space of, you know, legislative advocacy, because that creates the biggest change for us. Mm -hmm. um, we can change the laws and rewrite the laws. Uh, I also like to do it through political advocacy. I actively help individuals get elected or removed from office. So when they are working well for us, great. And when they are not, it's time to go. Um, and then I like to give back directly to my community. And, and I do this in the form of, you know, uh, entrepreneurship and generational wealth, where I teach individuals how to grow sustainable, profitable businesses that will change their economic security forever theirs and their families. And we're talking about generational wealth and what that looks like and how to create the greatest impact for us. So it may look like any and all of those things, but at the end of the day, it's all about healing black mm -hmm. and brown communities. And that's where I concentrate. Ooh, 
I love what you're doing. Now you kind of make me want to change my profession. Because <laughs> like, I start school next week in for paralegal nice. studies. And I want to work with kids. And specifically with foster kids and um, abused kids. Especially in the black community. Because I know a few people that like to uh, adopt black kids and abuse them. So yeah. we're going to stop that. Yeah, that <laughs> we're is a thing. That. that is a thing. That's right. Yeah, so that's what what field I'm trying to get into. So oh, that's awesome! Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I wanted to. Hold on. <laughs> I have it on here, but it's like stretch it out. <laughs> okay, I wanted to talk about your entrepreneur. You being an entrepreneur too. What do you do? Like, how do you educate people and mentor people through your yeah. education? Yeah, so I got into the entrepreneurship space uh, really early. Right? I recognized, uh, like I mentioned earlier, my wife and I, we met in college and we had some serious conversations as young people, you know, um, just, you know, about our family and about what that might look like. And, uh, you know, if we were to get married and, you know, what does that look like? And, you know, what might retirement look like for us and things like that, you know. So I was thinking about these things as a young person. Um, and then my wife and I got married young and decided to start our family young, right? So in those moments, all of it was just a reality. What do I do to one, generate income and two, be there for my family as much as possible without missing anything? And I recognized, you know, nine to five, some manner, shape or form, it wasn't going to cut it. There was no way that I could sit there and own my calendar working for someone else. So I dove right into entrepreneurship, uh, not knowing anything at all. <laughs> so I made every and any mistake that you could possibly make uh, on my way up. But eventually, like everything else, you know, if you stick to it, eventually you get through it. And just like that, I was, you know, failing forwards and getting better. And then eventually meeting mentors and individuals who could really shape and guide my journey, making it much easier. And at that point in time, I said, all right, you know, I'm finally starting to get successful in this space. Let me do the exact same thing. Right, let me share this information with others. So I've been doing that for 20, 25 years now, sharing that that business growth model and how to better and how to make better your business or get into it for the first time. I've been doing that for a really long time, just in the local capacity, because I've done all of this in the offline space. Right. I've never been an online animal in my life. I'm just <laughs> getting here for the first time. So <laughs> I was doing all of this. And what happened is. I started to get really good at explaining some of these complex topics very, very simply. And being a, uh, an excellent guide, right? And a mentor for individuals going through the process. So in my during, my, during my career, I've written curriculums and things like that. So once again, my children graduated. I finally had time and energy. And I said, you know, I'm gonna sit down and wanna reflect and think about how my life has gone and you know what has worked and what hasn't. And then two, as I started to reflect on that, I just really recognized how grateful I am to have such an amazing journey, both personally and professionally. And then I thought about how more people should be having that experience themselves. And if we can do that in an entrepreneurial sense, that's one of the best ways for someone to seriously change their dynamic, right? Their wealth dynamic, health, wealth, relationships, all of that gets better when you're making serious money and you're able to help out your friends and family and loved one and drive towards your passion. So great, let me start to really concentrate in that space. Let me write some curriculum that allows people to learn that and step into that space, be more successful. And that's exactly what's happened now. So I offer these opportunities for individuals to build their business, grow their business, get to that six and seven figure level, because that's where you're gonna be able to have the impact in your life. You know, Most entrepreneurs, they start a business and they struggle in the tens of thousands of dollar range. But if you are not at the six figure or seven figure range, you can't have the impact in your life. You can't make the impact in other people's lives. And you just can't be as powerful as you could or should be if you are not operating at that level. So let me show you how to do that. And then from there, continue to grow forward and remember to give back. So on your website, how do we get involved in that? <laughs> like I'm sitting here, I'm all invested. I want to know. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so is it on your website? Yeah. So much of that, um, and again, this is this was part of what I was just saying. 
I've only done this in the offline space, like in my immediate communities, the people I can immediately touch, the people that have found me in New York and all these other spaces, right? I am now getting into the online space and sharing and creating those opportunities. So this year, I'm going to open that up to the public. All of my private clients that I've been working with, all of the curriculums and all of the tips and tricks and and all of the courses that I've created for them, I am going to now share that publicly this year. So over the next, uh, probably by the summertime, you should start to see, um, obviously in the in the digital space there, right? You go to my website, you'll be able to find opportunities where you can start to sign up for some of those courses, reach out to me directly. Uh, I'll be updating that over the next month or two. And by the summertime, that should be... Um, kind of in full effect at this point. Uh, I've been working with my, I've been working with some teams behind the scene that are also helping to orchestrate all of this because it is a a serious endeavor, you know, to create your online business. Uh, and I spent, I spent the last two years kind of really learning what that looked like, how that operated, because I know what it looks like in the offline space, but what does that look like online? So once I learned it, I am now wrapping that up and buttoning those things up in my own space and I'll have those available shortly. But it's been such a beautiful experience just working with so many entrepreneurs and business owners and leaders of our communities. Uh, It's just amazing to see how much good work we have the ability individually to put right back into our world. It's absolutely amazing. We just have to step up into that space. I'm just I'm so honored and so privileged with some of the people I've been working with. Yeah, definitely. It sounds amazing. I can't wait till you, whenever you get it up and going, I want you back on my podcast again to talk yes. about it more. <laughs> like, I, I want to get involved in it because I'm yeah. trying to do better for myself as well. So, yeah, yeah whenever yeah. whenever you get that going, then I'm definitely going to keep in touch. <laughs> yes, for sure. In the meantime, you know, individuals, just like they've been now, individuals have just been reaching out to me in a, just a one on one capacity. And I've been helping individuals as I go uh, to the best of my ability with my calendar at this point. Uh, pretty soon, I'll be turning that over into uh, a much larger teaching opportunity. So that's why I have make more op- make more time for those individuals to really help make a dent again in the generational wealth that affects our communities. It's so important. Yeah, definitely. So I want to thank you so much, Gary, for coming on my podcast today and chatting with me. Yes, for sure. It was absolutely. A pleasure and an honor, and I uh, can't wait to do it again. Yeah, definitely. You have a great day. Thank you, Bert. Bye. Bye bye. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you so much for listening to my interview with Gary. So, if you want to know anything about Gary or how to get involved or anything about his book, how to purchase his book, go to www.garyoville.com and check it out. Bye. Thank mm-hmm. you.